Hello, it's Scott Manley here. The time has finally come. The dawn of Kerbal Space Program 2 is practically upon us. And yours truly, along with a bunch of cool people in the space industry, the gaming industry, and more importantly, the space gaming industry, all got flown to Europe to experience uh, an early look at Kerbal Space Program 2 for ourselves. Basically, we all got set up with our own PCs in a big room, each had a, an early copy of the game with video capture software, and we could basically play it, we could experience it, we could push the limits, some more than other, and you know, we were told that there were some really cool tutorials, which, of course, most of the experienced Kerbal players looked at for about three seconds before moving on to the actual game itself. Now you might wonder, why was this event in Europe, rather than, say, Seattle, where the developers are based? Well, this was hosted by the European Space Agency at ESTEC, the European Space Research and Technology Centre. If you've only become a regular viewer of me in the last couple of years for my space and science coverage, you might not realise that I practically launched this YouTube channel's popularity with Kerbal Space Program, and this game did a fantastic job of inspiring a lot of young people to become engineers and scientists in aerospace. NASA collaborated with the developers to add the parts to make SLS and perform the asteroid redirect mission. European Space Agency added Bepi Colombo and a Solar Orbiter. A Kerbal plushie flew to the space station on board the Starliner. Tori Bruno called it the best computer game available, and Elon Musk is looking forward to Kerbal Space Program 2. And with such high expectations for this launch, I'm sure you're all wondering whether they've checked their staging. The sequel was announced via a trailer in 2019 which really struck a chord with fans. It showed the game expanding to new scales, allowing you to build huge colonies on other planets that could harvest resources and using that you could build futuristic engines that would take you to other star systems. And beyond this scaled up vision for the universe, they also wanted to make it easier for people to access and make the whole thing prettier with new graphics and music and they said that this would be released in 2020. And when I sat down to talk to the creators of the game, I told them that was crazy and they should take as long as they needed. Well, yes, now it's 2023 and we do have early access. It's not the full game. In fact, it is objectively in many ways a step back from what is currently available. A lot of the new features are coming in future updates, which, well, don't have dates. What we will have is the vastly improved graphics and sound and the easier access for new players via the tutorial. So let's take a look at one of the tutorials. And yeah, that's me in the top right actually playing this live. And yeah, I did dress up like a World War One fighter pilot for uh, reasons. Let's try this. How do rocket? Oh, really? Okay, we'll try this. So look, obviously this isn't aimed at me. I'm not going to learn a lot about flying a rocket. I might learn a bit though about making better looking videos. I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but they have a, a lot of tutorials. They have like, you know, missing the ground, orbits are weird, orbital transfers, and these like dovetail with actual in-game tutorials, which I will show you. As you embark on your journey into rocketry, it's important to get all the crashing out of your system here in the simulator. It really cuts down on the awkward phone calls. Today, you'll be launching into the virtual skies over KSC, where you'll learn how to control a rocket. Oh yeah, I need to get something like that. I get now, <laughs> yeah. Let's learn how to okay, rotate, rotate. Great. Let's zoom in and out. Nice. Go Great. ahead and pick your favorite view for this launch. Okay, how do you do that? Your rocket is ready for launch. Every good launch starts with a big green button and lots Yay, of fire. Yay, lots of fire. Most bad launches do too, actually. <laughs> okay. Looking good. Ascend to 1,000 meters, and then we'll learn some controls. I know, I'm already ahead of you there. So for those of you that haven't guessed, by the way, those blue edges, those are supposed to show that this is inside a simulator. <laughs> okay, you're a kilometer up. You can still crap when flying a rocket or a plane. We have specific terms for moving. Pitch tilts your rocket's nose up and down. Nice pitch. Now, let's move on. Yaw steers your rock now. Yaw to the left. Excellent. Now for the final control. That's the basics of rocket flight. Feel free to experiment with the controls. We can move on when you're ready. So while there's a big difference in the user interface, the controls are basically the same at this point. Let's try flying this to the island. 
How are we doing in terms of fuel here? Uh, surface 400 meters per second. Okay, that's pretty good. We're incoming on the island. I'm going to throttle back because I don't need quite so much speed. This was, of course, to see if the island airstrip was still there. Who cares about the tutorial? I'm flying this sucker. That's what I was like, I am the tutorial. Hey! Uh, <laughs> you can see the engine gimballing to provide the steering. This has a surprising amount of author control authority, <laughs> considering <laughs> it's a rocket. Gimb yeah, okay. I guess at this point I should try throttling down and see if, uh, if I can maintain level flight. Okay. Airstrip is in sight. Yeah, it's sinking, so I need to... Yeah, okay, here we go. If you look in the bottom right, by the way, you'll notice that this engine is running off CH4 methane and liquid oxygen. There we go. Bang! Well, it's technically true that space is in all Continue. directions. Okay, we're good. Now look, I totally understand that many of you grown-ups out there might not be so interested in learning how to fly rockets from what sounds like a squeaky kid, but I assure you there will be a very grown-up Scotsman who is going to be delighted for another opportunity to teach everyone how to fly rockets and how to land them on other planets. So let's actually take a rocket for a spin, uh, just to get an idea of the look. So as, as it took off there, I think you probably saw there was this nice rocket plume coming out of the flame diverters. The space center, it looks a lot more detailed than there was was in the original game. Like this is just one of the launch pads, there are multiple launch pads out there, there are two runways, because obviously they have this plan that it's going to be multiplayer capable at some point in the future. Look at those volumetric clouds in the background. Now the rocket boosters are orange uh, because they want to do something different from SLS. Those are supposed to be solid rocket motors and the exhausts look visibly different from that of the core. Now in terms of the UI you still have the staging over on the right. You've now moved the nav ball over into the corner. I mean they've sort of gone for a visual change. Most of the controls are still in there. Obviously our Kerbal crew is up in the top right and you'll see that they react as we're steering. There's a lot more animations for the characters this time around. And yeah, in the background you can hear there's a soundtrack. You've got this sort of dramatic music that's supposed to make you feel like you're going places, getting high. Uh, notice, by the way, the rockets are now expanding out as we get to higher and higher altitudes and the air pressure is dropping off. And now those solid motors are almost out of fuel. They're going to cut off and then we can perform stage separation. There we go. Beautiful! Obviously I'm using a slightly high angle of attack here because I performed my gravity turn just a little too early. So this design was supposed to have enough delta V to go to the moon. Unfortunately due to some uh, control issues and well me being an idiot I accidentally dropped that stage while it was still firing. But I wasn't going to be deterred. We were on a space mission. We were going to get somewhere. But of course, the first place that we have to get is orbit. That's the sort of, you know, first step to everywhere is getting to orbit around the planet. Our apogee is in space, but our perigee is still inside the planet, so we need to circularize. So we do the usual thing, we select our point on the orbit, time warp to that point, and then watch as the, you know, the physics system propagates our spacecraft forwards in time. Now, Initially it does it slowly because I'm inside the atmosphere and it doesn't want to do that too fast. Once you get above the atmosphere, it moves faster. We get to see this sunset over the planet. And uh, yeah, we get, we get to the point where we need to make our circularization burn. So light up that engine. And uh, yeah, you can look in the bottom left again. AP is basically my apogee and PE is my perigee. We want to bring the perigee up to outside the atmosphere and that way I will be in a stable orbit. Again, take a moment to appreciate that the rocket engine actually looks a lot more realistic than it did in the original Kerbal. Now to go further afield, it, this is the time to start using the maneuver planner. We've seen this in the original Kerbal, they're using the same concept, maneuver nodes. So you basically simulate firing your engine at this location and you see how it changes the orbit. Now I'm going to say at this point there were problems I had with this because there were features that I had relied upon that were missing. Specifically, I couldn't just click on one of these nodes and have it stay up while I went and tweaked everything. 
Uh, and because I kind of injected it into a, a very substandard orbit, because I'd screwed up, it made it very hard for me to actually get to this target. And of course, I've flown this entirely manual without the need for navigation, but when you're trying to do it very quickly, uh, you know, <laughs> it can be, uh, can be kind of stressful. But I did come up with an astro navigation solution that delivered me to the sphere of influence of the minor moon of Kerbin known as Minmus. This is the small blue, eh, icy, salt, you know, pudding. It could be many things. The legends do say that it is the desert planet. You know, the desert planet of Arrakis has spice. Well, the desert planet of Minmus has pudding. But of course, you all played the original Kerbal, so you know that. What you do have now is a shinier surface. It looks different. It's completely revamped. The artists have gone and you know, redone all of the planets and celestial bodies in the Kerbal system. You can see a lot more cloud structure on Jewel. There's like a ring around Dreads. I would love to show you all these, except actually there was a problem with the recording. So yeah, you have me landing on Minmus. And this is a rather momentous occasion because it's actually my first landing in a Kerbal Space Program too. You know, one small step for a manly, one giant leap for manly kind. So I might as well commemorate this occasion with planting a flag. You see that we now have a more complete animation on the characters. You're going to get a lot more of that, although I do notice he is floating above the surface. Ah, uh, okay, well I'm sure they'll fix that. Anyway, let's take a look at the construction interface. This is a big part of Kerbal Space Program. So you have a sort of revamped vehicle assembly building. First thing is you can repaint all the parts. That's a standard feature now. There are a few new parts in here, but actually there's a lot of missing parts that are currently in the, the main game. There's also a lot of parts that will be needed for future features. Those aren't in here right now. There's now buttons to go to like orthographic views so you can align all the parts correctly. And they have got rid of all the wings in the original Kerbal. It is now an entirely procedural wing based system. So there's now only like essentially three types of wings. There's like plain wings, there's wings with a control surface in them, or there is an all moving wing which is a control surface. And this is a huge deal in simplifying the design. Instead of trying to mix and match different wings, you know, sections to join them together, you can just pop on a wing, adjust its parameters, you know, try to get the look that you need to match what you want. Obviously, I wanted a play, a yellow plane with pink canards and green wings because that's clearly, you know, cutting edge. I mean, it's like the opposite of stealth. People will see that, see its bright colors, and presume that it is some kid's toy rather than a, you know, high-performance experimental aircraft. Uh, okay, well, let's stress the experimental. I think the amount of color and wing surface does seem to be confusing the autopilot somewhat. Yeah, let's switch to a more sensible aircraft and uh, take it for a spin around the space center to get an idea of that terrain. Obviously. When we took off in that rocket, we were just going up and away and we could not get down into the trees, so to speak. And there are a lot of trees. In fact, if you get really up close, you can see that they're detailed down to individual leaves. You can't actually collide with them at this time. I'm not sure if they're going to make those collidable. I hope they do. There's a cool Kerbal statue down there. Well, there's a helipad on the roof of that building, which is good because, you know, that's something we commonly do in challenges is try to land on these things. Not sure if there's uh, helipads on the roof of the vehicle assembly building, maybe we'll get close enough. Yeah, that semicircular building is probably the astronaut complex. I'm thinking that these buildings are maybe R&D because they bring over one important feature. Uh, yeah, the bridge! And now I've seen it, I have to go after it. Yes, those bridges. They are the challenge that I want. I'm gonna go full on X-Wing, trench run underneath the bridges. Let's get myself set up. So apparently that dock, by the way, that is another place where you can spawn uh, vehicles. That's actually something that I believe they added because uh, uh, fans asked. Okay, I have you now. Get myself lined up here. 120 meters per second. That's about 240 knots. 260 knots. Underneath the bridge, underneath the other bridge, and out. Nice. Victory roll time! Nice, look at that! Uh, that's obviously part of the tracking station as well. 
Now when you're doing stuff like this, one of the things you realise is missing is uh, the first person view from the cockpits. None of those are in here right now. It's also missing all the parts from uh, making history, the robotic parts from breaking ground, all the parts that are required for uh, spacecraft thermodynamics. There's no resource extraction or processing at this time. There's no career mode, there's no science, there's no modding. This is, in many ways, a step backwards. And here's the thing. If you already have Kerbal Space Program, you can get a bunch of mods to make it look almost this good. When I bought the original Kerbal Space Program, it was $7. It was the best investment I ever made. The early access release for KSP2 is going to be $50, and that actually makes it $10 more than the original. But that isn't entirely fair, because there are two DLCs, Breaking Ground and Making History, which are kind of important to have in my mind. But yeah, if you're a newcomer that's never played any of this stuff and you suddenly want to fly and build spaceships, it's hard to argue that you should get the sequel. When the original is there, it's better supported and has a lot of stuff. But that's right now. This is early access. We have a roadmap of new features that are going to be added down the line, which will make it into a completely separate experience with a lot more. If you're looking at what's provided and saying there's not enough for you, that's fine, right? If you have any questions about whether you should spend money on an early access title, I would always say, no, wait, right? There's, there's no harm in waiting. Furthermore, if you're not running a reasonably modern PC, you might pay very careful attention to the specifications that they published. Something like only one third of Steam users have the minimum required and only about the top 3% have the recommended system. My newly built PC is great in terms of its CPU and its memory and its hard disk, but its graphics card is one notch below the recommended GPU, so I'm going to be interested to see how that runs. I'm actually going to make a point of trying to run the game on the PC that I've made my Interstellar Quest series on. As far as I'm concerned, I'm getting it day one and I'm going to explore it and push the limits and see what I can find out there. I'm going to see the development happen and I hope that a few of you will come along for the ride with me. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.